morning and happy Sunday to you all. Thank you for coming over here, those of you who are in the chapel, and also greetings to those who are over next door in sanctuary line. Voice now will Sunday. Uh, it is a wonderful Sunday to be together in the meal together at St. Mark's. A special welcome to those of you who are St. Mark's and newer to uh, the Episcopal Church. This week starts Holy Week tradition of uh, panoply of the death and resurrection, the central events. Christ our Savior. So this morning you are here in the actual original church marks that uh, but shortened over the years to expand what is now our sanctuary. This is now the chapel of Mary Magdalene. And on Sundays at eight o'clock worship in the chapel. So in just a moment I'm going to invite and uh, we're going to turn to our bulletins. We're going to have the liturgy of the palms, and then we're going to have a procession that is led by the giant palm and our holding our hosannas as we sing that wonderful hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Uh, we have, with the rain and the wet, sort of a hybrid plan, part of the here in the chapel, and then uh, taking a, a shorter route. Just follow the folks in front of you. If that come immediately to your left and use the ramp and go and when you came in here this morning continue then with our worship so again thank you for being with us here at St. Mark's and I'll invite Nancy to open and body or spirit. Bless who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. was proclaimed as king of kings, those who spread their garments and branches of palm along these branches. 
be for signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in
God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God who loves us and calls us to respond, amen. How did the hosannas of Palm Sunday turn to the crucify him of Good Friday? Five days. Just five days. Or for those of us who are here on Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday, about 50 minutes. How did the Hosannas of Palm Sunday turn to the crucify him of Good Friday? Well, Good Friday last year, a woman in Baltimore called up her daughter who lived in Arkansas, and she was quite distraught on the phone, barely finding her words. I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your father and I are getting a divorce. It's been 30 years and we're both miserable. Now, I, I don't want to hear the objections. I can't stand to talk about it anymore. So call your sister in California and you let her know. So the daughter, catching her breath, called her sister and told her the news on the other end of the line. And her sister, flabbergasted, said, what? They'll do no such thing. Don't worry, I will handle this. So she hangs up on her sister and calls her mother and says, you are not getting a divorce. You will not do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my sister back and we're both flying there tomorrow and you will wait until we get there before you do a thing. So when the mother hung up the phone, she looked over at her husband and with this sort of Grinch-like Ryle smi smile, she said, okay, both girls are coming home for Easter and they're paying for their own tickets. <laughs> this year we've taken a different approach to this Palm Sunday liturgy. Actually, so that this transition, Palm Sunday to Passion, isn't quite as much of a whiplash. We'll hear the Passion reading from Mark's Gospel as the very last part of our liturgy today, sending us and setting the tone for Holy Week. And we'll invite you this morning to depart in silence whenever you are ready. No agape today. We have a guide to Holy Week here at St. Mark's for you, inserted into your bulletin to help you prepare for these coming days. It is our hope that you will join us for any or all of these liturgies and services to come. But even if you can't, perhaps to read more about them to help you pray through this week. For those who are interested in continuing the conversation of the Passion, 
Debbie and I have prepared a forum on the meaning of the cross and the passion. And you can join us over in the Kennedy Room following a time of silence after the passion for this conversation. We took a different approach, in part because in the spirit of one of my namesakes, I wanted to have a brief fireside chat with you this morning as your interim rector. Now, many of you were here last week as we commissioned the rector search committee for St. Mark's. We all raised our hands over Anne, Peter, Marjolin online, Ken at the 8 o'clock service, Lena, Lodovic, Virginia, Jessica, and Marina. And when we did that, we responded to a series of questions. One of which, and I pointed this out at the time, was asked, will you set aside your assumptions or expectations for what your new rector should look or be like and open yourself to new possibilities for the gifts and for new possibilities and gifts that the candidates for rector may bring to your parish and we all answered hopefully without crossing our fingers behind our back we will with God's help. Now, beloved, this, in my opinion, is a Palm Sunday question. And I wanted to take a moment to unpack it with us as we not only embark upon Holy Week, during which we are caught up in the final things of our faith, as it were, Jesus' death and resurrection, his promise to come again, but also as your search embarks upon their journey as a committee to bring to the vestry and ultimately to who God already knows will be your next rector here at St. Mark's. Now, why do I say this is a Palm Sunday question? Well, to various degrees, there was a tension in Jesus' ministry throughout the Galilee. Because as belief grew that he was the Messiah, so did the assumptions and the expectation for what would happen when he came into Jerusalem. In Mark, this desire was generated even more so by the holding back of this revelation in what sometimes is called the messianic secret that is, when Jesus says to someone he's healed, or to a disciple, or apparently to Episcopalians, tell no one what you've seen or heard. <laughs> Episcopalians are really good at keeping the messianic secret. I preached a few weeks ago, you may remember that the Jesus were expecting an insurrection but ultimately got resurrection. And so I say it is a Palm Sunday question because as it says, will you set aside your assumptions or expectations of what your new rector should look or be like is, well, not so easy. For disciples who follow a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and for those of us excitedly embarking on a search for a new rector. One of the more helpful portions of interim training they require of us for becoming interims is a bias awareness teaching. And yes, your search committee and vestry will receive some version of this in due course. It is helpful because as the question contains within it, we do, all of us, live with assumptions and expectations of what the new rector should look or be like. I'm remembering the power of this bias in the 1996 movie, A Time to Kill, 
when Matthew McConaughey's character, a lawyer, is defending Samuel Jackson's character in a murder trial. In his closing argument in that courtroom in the deep south, McConaughey's character asks the jury to close their eyes and imagine what he's getting ready to tell them. He shares a gut-wrenching, horrific story of a little girl whose liberty and life are brutally taken. He draws the jury, and of course in the cinematography, he draws in the audience with this terrifying story, eyes all closed, imagining it as he's saying it. Essentially telling us what happened to Jackson's character's daughter in the film. And then at the very end, he says to them of this little girl, now imagine she's white. And as he says it, their eyes open in the courtroom. Stating essentially that was the farthest thing from what they were imagining. It isn't wrong to have assumptions or expectations, but it is also important to recognize hidden biases within them and, as the question suggests, work to set them aside. This ultimately isn't something most of the disciples can do as they basically abandon Jesus in the course of a few days after following him for more than three years. Even Peter denies him three times. It is hard to set aside our assumptions and expectations of what should be. But all is not lost on this Palm Sunday, going into this Holy Week. Because, beloved, while Jesus di disappointed the assumptions and the expectations of the disciples, and I might add, can disappoint us in our expectation and assumption, the disciples still kept some modicum of hope that God was doing something with this teacher, this master, this Lord of theirs, that there was some openness, a crack in the door for them to choose, to risk, to go on to Galilee where Jesus said he would meet them. Who knows if he would show? Who knows if that was still a part of the plan in the way they we're thinking Jesus was trying to fulfill it. There is probably something to the disciples' hope, though, that is instructive for us. Because while it is hard to put our assumptions and expectations aside, hope yet abides. So even as we, with God's help, seek to put these aside... And to open ourselves to the possibilities and gifts that the candidates for rector may bring to our parish. We also live this Palm Sunday. This triumphal moment that starts our search. Asking God to reveal our biases. Our, our expectations. And in doing so, beloved, laying them this week before the cross. Because in this search, we may not go where or get what or who we want. But instead, who and where God tells us our new rector will meet us. That is the task to being faithful in this search. And I believe that hope is a beautiful thing for us at St. Mark's this Palm Sunday. So I want to close with a parable 
that I first encountered on one of the streaming Apple TV Plus shows called Stillwater. It's from the Eastern traditions. What I want to invite you to do is to close your eyes and take a breath with me. I want you to imagine yourself at the bank of a creek or a riverside, perhaps, as you hear this parable. Master Chu was at the river with her young student, Ying. They were washing their bowls. Suddenly, Ying spotted something unusual floating past. Teacher, she said, do you see that floating in the water? A scorpion, it seems. Scorpions do not swim, master. It must have fallen in the river. Yes, it seems so. If we do not help it, it will surely drown. Yes, we must help. And just as readily as Ying reached out her hand, she pulled it back again. Oh, forgive me, teacher. Scorpions have pinching claws and a stinging tail. And you do not wish to be hurt. Not to worry, my child. I will try it. Master Chu carefully cupped her hands to lift the scorpion, and upon setting it down on the ground, ouch! Oh, oh, Master, you've been stung. The sting of a scorpion can be very painful, but Master Chu was very brave and very strong. I will be fine, my young friend. The two continued washing their bowls when Ying noticed something familiar floating past. Master, the scorpion! It must have fallen in again. Let us hope this time it will be gentle. Master Chu again cups her hand and takes the scorpion further from the water, carefully laying it on the ground. Ouch! Alas! I was wrong. Master Chu's student was amazed that her teacher would do the same thing twice. Teacher, why do you continue to save the scorpion when you know it is in its nature to sting? Because it is in my nature to save it. Saving a life is surely worth the chance of a sting. Beloved, we worship a God whose nature it is to save, even at great cost. Let us keep the hope that is beyond our view of what might be best, so that we can receive the power of God in Jesus' passion, and walking the way of this search and the way of Holy Week together. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or spirit. And on page eight in your bulletin, using ancient words of common faith, we join with Christians around the world saying the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God.
trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things. Let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Blessed one, today the church sings glad hosannas as we enter Holy Week. Prepare us to bear witness to Christ's suffering and death endured for our sake. Gather your people around the cross and comfort us with resurrection hope. As we grieve the sins of colonialism, we remember especially the Church of the Province of West Africa, the Diocese of Chungugu, Cyprus, and the Gulf, Dejan, and North Dakota, South Dakota, and Dallas. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is Renew your good creation and protect all life on earth. Encourage the work of foresters, scientists, ar arborists, gardeners, and river keepers. We pray for the health of pollinating insects, songbirds, and native plants. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy. Shepherd the Ohlone, Mawakma, and Ramatush tribes on whose land we meet. Establish peace and justice among the nations. Hold to account any with authority to judge others. Grant that courts, legislatures, and local governments will serve with integrity and compassion. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Bring hope to any who feel forsaken or forgotten. Make a way for refugees and asylum seekers. Reunite families enduring war and separation. We pray for any who are incarcerated, institutionalized, or in foster care that they may know your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Bless those who are homebound, lonely, grieving, ill, or in any kind of distress. We pray especially for Meredith, Talia, Will, Lee, Pam, Terry, and the Heller family, Mary Jane, Matthew John, Richard, Channing, Carrie, Kevin, Yo, Vassar, Chung Ling, Eric and Lily. Barbara, Christopher, Joni, Paul, the Knickerbocker family, Jackie Ray, Lisa, Emily, Paul, Teresa, Sharon, Emily, Nina, Bill, Justin, Katie, John, Debbie, Alex, and the Thomas family. Mary, Brian, Abby, Peter John, Howard, Claudio, Jonathan, and those we now name.
Hear us, O oh God. Blessed one, our times are in your hand. We remember our departed loved ones, especially Mary, Annas, Paul, Marcina, and those we now name. Sustain us in discipleship throughout our lives and receive us into everlasting life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we turn to the liturgy of the tables, know that all are invited to come up and gather around the altar um, after we share the peace with one another. Especially invite any newcomers who are here to join us and to come forward and to know that we would like to know you as well and to our friends who are online. We are glad to be sharing this liturgy with you. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a greeting of peace with one another. We now turn to the Liturgy of the Table. Wherever you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome at the Lord's Table. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
As we gather now at this table of praise and thanksgiving, I invite you to offer aloud or in the silence of your heart any special thanks to the Lord that are within you today. <laughs> yes. And for this whole community that comes together with such joy and a special feast like this, uh, and at all times, even ordinary days, as a community that cares for each other. For this beautiful Palm Sunday. Aww. Lord, you hear our thanks and know our hearts. And we know that all good comes from you. Amen. May God be with you. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing that we should at all times and all places give thanks unto you, O Lord Almighty, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who for our sins was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself, who by his suffering and death became the author of eternal life and salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy. glory be to you, O Lord our God, for that you created heaven and earth and made us in your own image and of your tender mercy gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and complete sacrifice for the whole world and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord, we, your people, do celebrate and make with these your holy gifts which we now offer unto you, the memorial your Son has commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again with power and great glory. And we most humbly beseech you, O merciful God, to hear us and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be unto us the body and blood of your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And we earnestly desire your goodness to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, whereby we offer and present unto you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies. Grant, we beseech you, that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And also that we and your whole church may be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto you, Almighty God, world without end. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, The gifts of God for the people of God.
I invite you to stand in body or spirit. And on page 14 in your bulletin. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we invite the congregation to be seated. For kids aged 1 to 92 who would like to go with Lily to hear more about the Passion in a different way and to work on a craft activity, you're also welcome to stay here and hear our Passion. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, 
Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, for I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, This day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, for many gave false testimony against him and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You were also with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, 
on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, 
casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. 